Hello, and welcome to another spine-ripping, face-shattering, gear-grinding episode of What Happened, the show where we dig deep into the torso of the pop culture world to pluck out the juicy, still-beating hearts of unmitigated disaster-tainments. Now, way back in our second episode, we covered one of the more infamous of those disasters, with 2000's uh, less-than-fondly-remembered Mortal Kombat Special Forces, but now it's time to move into the arena of celluloid with 1995's Mortal Kombat The Motion Picture. <gasps> of, of, of course we're not, because that still stands as one of the most entertaining video game films of all time. No, no, no. This episode is dedicated to 1997's abysmally depressing follow-up, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Our story begins, as all good stories do, in the early 1990s, where Lawrence Kasanoff, we'll just call him Larry, was coming off a lucrative deal with James Cameron on the merchandising of a tiny indie film called Terminator Goddamn 2. At the time, Larry was president of Cameron's Lightstorm Entertainment and took care of the day-to-day -day business, while Cameron, you know, made all the groundbreaking films. Larry was the one, however, who had brokered a deal earlier that year with Midway to produce the incredible coin-op version of Judgment Day and had been invited to Midway's Chicago offices to see what they were up to next. Larry wound up getting to play an early build of Mortal Kombat, and something immediately sparked within him. Dollar signs. When he looked upon the forms of the little digitized actors uppercutting each other to death, he turned to Midway producer Neil Nacasto and exclaimed, This is like Star Wars meets Enter the Dragon. If you give me the rights to this, I promise that I will not only make this into a movie, but I'll produce this in every medium in the world. A, a movie, a TV show, an animated TV show, a stage show, a music album. I promise I will do that. Baffled, Mr. Nacasta replied, and I quote, you're full of shit. It's just a fucking video game. So that was the end of that. A year and a half later, which places us at the tail end of 1993, Mortal Kombat had become such a phenomenon that Midway finally saw the merchandising and movie potential of the franchise. Kasanoff was quick to pounce. He had left Lightstorm Entertainment to form his own company, Threshold, with the express goal of having Mortal Kombat be its crown jewel. He wanted to make it so that whenever you saw this logo, you'd then associate it with this logo. Oh man, that's such a lame logo. Anyway, Larry did indeed do exactly what he said. Not only did he fast track a Mortal Kombat movie, he started developing a bad TV show, a bad animated TV show, a terrible animated movie, and whatever this was supposed to be. My name is Shang Tsung. Now, the quality of some of those projects aside, this was an ambitious and forward-thinking plan, something that wouldn't be attempted until the Matrix sequels almost a decade later. Spreading a franchise tries across various entertainment mediums in a short time to raise maximum awareness amongst the fans, so gotta give him credit for that. However, his business partners within Hollywood cautioned him that video games were the most poisonous poison to ever poison, that his career would be over when MK flopped, and with Super Mario Bros. stinking up the multiplexes at the time, they did have a point. Undaunted, Uncle Larry pressed on, as he felt as long as they took the core of MK's story, a martial arts tournament with the fate of the world hanging in the balance, it would translate into a strong enough concept to pull in both fans and general audiences alike. This thinking worked, as the movie built upon the narrative of MK with additional plot points and character motivations, as well as bolstering the appeal with some cool visual effects, well, at, at the time. So when it launched in August of 1995, Mortal Kombat made over $120 million worldwide against a budget of 18. This seemingly broke the video game curse that had perpetuated Hollywood, which admitted had been enforced by three flops in the previous two years. Fans of this show should know by now, though, that when there's a specific personality swirling in the center of a narrative, things tend to get very what happeny very fastly. Since the first movie was such a hit, Larry felt he immediately needed to capitalize with a sequel, so he fast-tracked it with as much of the original crew as he could, maybe a bit too fast. The first red flag in this creative process was that the original director Paul W.S. I Married My Own O.C. Anderson declined to return, as he wanted to do something completely different for his follow-up film, which would be Event Horizon. Where am I going? We won't need eyes to see. 
Therefore, Larry felt in lieu of an exhaustive and time-consuming hunt for a new director, they'd simply promote the DP of the first film, one John R. Leonetti. And while some people may know this, a, a quick refresher. The director of photography usually frames the film to find the most interesting and dynamic shots that best suit the script. And while that's a useful skill, Leonetti had never actually directed before, which, as you can imagine, has far more responsibilities. In fact, many people who were in lower positions on the production of the first Mortal Kombat were all promoted to higher ones, which Larry admits was a massive mistake. This, in hindsight, was probably not the best thing I did. The first movie was so successful against all odds, so I did what I felt was right, promote everyone. We probably promoted everyone over and above, and too quickly from what we should have. Unfortunately, one of those not to receive a promotion was the writer of the first film, Kevin Droney, who had, uh, passed on the project to work on Wing Commander instead, which was like basically dodging a bullet but then stepping right into the path of a harpoon. Larry then looked to two other writers who he had previously worked with to quickly bang out a story, and bang they did. This then opened up a mysterious portal where a third writer was revealed. Phonosak Yarao. Yes, Larry promoted himself to a writing position. But why? Well, simply put, because he could. The movie would be dubbed Mortal Kombat Annihilation, as it roughly, like really roughly, was sort of kind of based on Mortal Kombat 3, which involved the merging of both Outworld and Earthrealm. Now that we covered the production side, it's time to talk about the cast, which is a whole different barrel of spinal cords. Robin Shu returned as Liu Kang, bringing his martial arts mastery back to the role. Talisa Soto portrayed Katana, bringing the charisma of a filing cabinet back to the role. It's a trap, Liu. Leave. And. Uh, that's about, that's about it. Christopher Lambert showed interest in returning as Raiden, but he had committed to a Beowulf project and couldn't fit it in his schedule. That, at least, that's what Larry says. In a 2006 interview, however, Connor McCloud himself plainly stated, I didn't want to do it because I didn't think the script was very good. I didn't like it. So James Ramar took up the robes and the Duke Nukem haircut of the Thunder God instead. Damn. I'm looking good. And in Ashby, who chewed all the scenery and wore all the sunglasses as Johnny Cage, was looking forward to reprising his role, but Larry had some other ideas. Since Mr. Ashby was one of the few working actors with some experience under his belt, he would be entitled for a pay raise, which Ashby surmises was the reason for Cage's, um, brief screen time in Annihilation. Larry wouldn't honor my sequel deal. I totally wanted to do a sequel and I was looking forward to it. Larry, in the way that he is, called me and said, here's the script, and I read it and I went, oh. So Lyndon dropped out and the part, all two and a half minutes of it, went to one, uh, this guy. Out of the entire cast from the first film, only two were returning to their original roles. Ashby felt that all this recasting, not just himself, irreparably hurt Annihilation. You can't just go, oh, I can recast them, which is what he did, and it sucked. The second movie sucked ass. What fucking morons. How would you like to see Empire Strikes Back, but Han Solo is played by someone else? It's the same characters, but different people are suddenly playing them. You go, that's not them, and that's how the fans respond. That's not Johnny Cage. That's not Sun. That's not Raiden. This this is stupid. Speaking of which, Bridget Wilson, who played the original Sonya Blade, also opted not to return as she was busy with other projects. Most notably, yeah, I remember that thing that you did that time. So Lieutenant Blade was instead brought to life by uh this woman? Yeah, I, I don't know. The rest of the cast was rounded out by stuntmen, various nobodies, and American gladiators. Oh, and Brian Thompson, can't forget about him. It is glorious! Now, with such an obviously messed up character select screen, how did Larry justify all these changes? The thing that happens with sequels is now everyone wants twice the money, ten times the money. In some cases, they deserve it, and in other cases, they don't. Midway, who was making a fourth game, or saying, hey, you promised us a movie and you've got to deliver because we've got a game to promote. And then the TV network says, well, listen, I can launch next September if you're going to have a movie now. And so you have all these things and there's a ripple effect if you take one away. And hey, 
Warner Brothers replaced Batman constantly and that still works. I hate to say this, but it all came down to business and money. Speaking of money, Annihilation had a much bigger budget than its predecessor, clocking in between 30 to maybe 40 million dollars, which they obviously only used a fraction of to pay the actors with. The budget mostly went towards expensive on-location shooting and uh, special effects. More on that later. The plan was for the shoot to last six months and would dot the globe between London, Jordan, Thailand, and Israel, which was pretty overwhelming for first-time director John Leonetti. Various sources close to the production confirmed this, with Paul Anderson even chiming in by saying, I know he didn't have a very happy time on the movie. The second movie had a lot of problems. I didn't want to go back and make the sequel, and the problems they had this time around were the reasons why I didn't want to go back. Now, this arduous shooting schedule came about due to lessons learned on the first film. They had finished principal photography, but then had to do some reshoots, specifically adding in two memorable fight scenes. Early test screenings showed that while audiences liked the film, they felt there needed to be more action. With this in mind, Larry decided to then base the sequel all around the fights, thus making sure there would be no need for expensive reshoots. It got to the point, however, where the movie's plot and characters took the furthest seat back in the MK Annihilation clown car, as the movie boiled down to a bunch of flippy whippy shit with a plot that could barely be considered comprehensible. This is amazing! It's the hot air rising from the Earth's car. We harness this energy. The first film worked so well because it focused on the journeys of our three main heroes, with each one learning a lesson along the way. Annihilation, however, focused solely on Liu Kang, I think, and his journey to learn how to stand from sweep distance whilst holding block and pressing down, down, and up. It's my animality. Jax learns that he doesn't need arms too, I guess, the, the entire plot of Annihilation, which hinged on the cliffhanger appearance of Shao Kahn at the very end of the last movie, resulted in some pacing problems it just never really recovered from. It didn't have time to breathe and reintroduce the new world and characters, mostly because... Uh, and in an organic way. Uh, new fighters suddenly popped up with no explanation or even a name, so it was... Uh, and this was due to the fact that Kasanoff felt they no longer needed to make a movie for a general audience, but instead... Okay, I, I, get, I get it, I get it. In total, 20 characters from MK3, Ultimate MK3, and even MK4 are all Chef Boyardeed overstuffed into Annihilation's runtime. Kasanoff wanted to cater exclusively to rabid fans who only wanted to see their favorite characters do their favorite special moves, context, and plot be damned. Which is not that much different from nowadays. So it'll be no surprise that Annihilation's shooting script was constantly in flux due to the shooting schedule and, even with the increased budget, inability to make the written page a reality. One of the writers of the film, uh, this guy, clarified, I would be told, hey, this epic battle that was four pages long now needs to be a two-person battle that's two pages long. I remember there was a scene that I don't believe is even in the movie anymore, and if it is, it was much bigger in the script. Jax had to be rescued from this absolutely epic outworld prison. It was going to be this really big prison break sequence. That had to be changed or cut completely, so when you cut out a big sequence like that, the whole movie suffers because it was designed to be a big action set piece at a very specific point in the film. So that gargantuan outworld mega prison became a small lab in the middle of a desert and has a shot that looks like this in it. So, as the dailies came in, both writers back in Hollywood were, um, a little taken aback. I saw a lot of the early cuts of the film, and I saw a lot of dailies. There were so many things that had been cut, and so many things that had to been shot a different way than how they were written. So, there was just a lot of, oh, okay, that that's how that scene turned out. All right then. So, Annihilation had its fair share of problems, but most egregious of all is the fact that the movie was never really finished. One shooting wrapped up, a rough edit was put together, and then shown to test audiences, who all might have been high because according to New Line Cinema, they went bonkers for it. Crazy Larry explains, there was supposed to be another entire second pass of visual effects and editing, but New Line said, you know what, it's testing so well, it doesn't doesn't fucking matter. It was 
still going to be a hit, and by the way, it was. No, it wasn't. It would be a little naive to chalk up all the weird continuity errors and sloppiness due to the lack of a second editing pass, but it would explain at least a few things, like the same character getting killed in completely different shots. Nightwolf mentioning three tests, to beat Shao Kahn, you've gotta pass three tests, even though there's only one, and oodles of Dreamcast, uh, I mean PlayStation 1 levels of visual effects. But no amount of editing could excuse things like, Damn, you barbecued his ass. Or, Suckers! And especially, So when Annihilation finally jump kicked into theaters on November 21st, 1997, a number of things were working against it, aside from its general, you know, MK Annihilation-ness. Firstly, that Thanksgiving release date, not the most synergistic from a marketing perspective. Secondly, MK's popularity was indeed on a downtrend, as MK4, a low point in the franchise history, had been farted out just a month prior, so that might have had a negative effect. And thirdly, as Lyndon Ashby stated, trailers clearly showing that most of the characters had been recast didn't exactly inspire confidence in the product. So the movie was uh, annihilated in theaters, uh, a fatality had been performed on its chances of success, and uh, no mercy would be given to any other hilarious MK-based puns. Its worldwide performance though, its entire theatrical haul brought in about $51 million, barely squeaking out a profit and making less than half of what the first film did. Critically, however, it was far more brutal because according to Rotten Tomatoes, Annihilation is the second worst video game movie of all time, narrowly being edged out by UA Bulls Alone in the Dark, which, you know, is some type of honor. So those reviews, as you can surmise, were not kind. Witless, charmless, and clueless, as quoted by Empire, while the San Francisco Chronicle had a far more detailed opinion. It sought to adhere fairly closely to the source material, bringing in characters from MK2 and MK3, but in attempting to do so much fan service, it lost the first film's focus and suffered from some truly appalling performances. Why, whatever do you mean, San Francisco critic man? D do you mean this? You're alive. Too bad. You will die. Yeah, you probably do. And finally, cap it all off, the harshest critic, Ed Beasy himself, dubbed Mortal Kombat Annihilation as the worst moment of the franchise. And considering MK Advance exists, that's... As a, uh, that, that's a thing! Undaunted from all this bad press and meager profits, Leisure Suit Larry pushed forward with a third film, Mortal Kombat Devastation, but understood that, um, mistakes were made. There were a million cooks in the kitchen, but at the end of the day, the thing I learned that if it's not right, wait. Because we were on such a media train at that point with the animated series, live action series, etc. In order to fulfill that media train, I needed a movie at that time, and the reality was is that I didn't quite have the right team. But I had to stick to the schedule because there were so many things going on in the Mortal Kombat universe. Devastation would be stuck in developmental hell for a number of years until it was set to begin shooting in New Orleans in August of 2005. So, so yeah, that, that didn't happen. Then in 2009, Midway had a banner year. Well, not really, because they were closed down and all their assets were bought by Warner Brothers, Mortal Kombat included. Larry Kasanoff and the Threshold Boys disputed this with one of the craziest pieces of litigation ever covered here at What Happened. Now, forgive the wall of text, but every word, every syllable must be seen to be believed. In 1993, Kasanov visited Midway with an idea to launch the Mortal Kombat concept in a totally new direction. Specifically, Kasanov proposed to develop a full feature-length motion picture, a television series, and other productions. Midway was initially skeptical, as Kasanov's idea was revolutionary at the time. You know, fair enough. The Mortal Kombat franchise, as it stands today, is far more of a creation of Threshold and Kasanov than of Midway. Midway's creative output was almost entirely limited to the video video games. On their own, the video games provided only minimal backstory and mythology, and only flat, stock characters with virtually no character development. Threshold was responsible for transforming each of the patterned, stock characters present in the underlying Mortal Kombat video game from an unprotectable idea into 
fully realized, completely delineated, ooh, busting out the $5 words now, an independently copyrightable expression. Each such character is therefore a derivative work for which the copyright is owned by Threshold. These characters include Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, Sub-Zero, Scorpion, as well as 50 others. The suits also alleged that the Mortal Kombat brand was worth approximately 40 billion dollars, which I assume Threshold was looking forward to collecting, which they did not. While details were never made known to the public, it was apparently settled out of court and Threshold Entertainment fucked off. Since then, live action adaptations of MK have bounced around between concept pitches, web series and the like before finally landing in the lap of one James Wan, director slash producer of many horror films in the Conjuring franchise as well as Waterboy. While his role is limited to producing and shooting is scheduled to start later this year, details are still being kept under wraps with no director currently attached. Now in the twistiest of fates, a close collaborator to Mr. Wan, a man who is the DP on a number of his horror films, as well as since helming a few of his own, is none other than John R. Leonetti. So there is a very real chance that this Mortal Kombat reboot could have Leonetti behind the lens once more, seeking his redemption. It'll be very interesting to see how this all shakes out. As for crazy old Larry Kasanoff, well, in 2013 he roared back into the Hollywood scene with whatever the shit this is. He wrote, directed, and produced it. I. Uh... Post-editing update. Since the script was written, it seems unknown commercial director Simon McQuaid is now attached to direct, with two actors signing on to play Sub-Zero and Liu Kang, and finally there's the cherry on top of the Shao Kahn Tower. Crazy Larry has finagled his way to an executive producer credit. It all comes back again. If you know of any other spine-ripping, intestine-spewing gaming movie disasters you'd like to uppercut into our acid pool of judgment, sound off in the comments below or shadow kick your way over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially vote on what we'll take down next. See you next time and thanks for watching.